Thank you all. Oh, goodness sakes, thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you very much for that very kind and generous introduction and for your presentation. I got to thinking as I was listening to that, you've listened to all these great speakers today. You've got Governor Patrick after me and others. And the one thing you're definitely going to remember is that the bread slicer was invented in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> and to Mark Edwards, your Executive Director of Opportunity Nation. Thank you. Well, I don't know everyone in this room personally, obviously, but let me tell you, I do feel like I'm among family. Because when I look at Opportunity Nation's mission to repair the ladder of opportunity in this country, uh, that's the same mission that has been my driving passion for nearly four decades of my public life. Now, believe it or not, I was not born wearing a suit and tie. Uh, or with the name Senator in front of my name. As uh, Rob said, my mother was an immigrant. My dad was a coal miner, had a sixth grade education. Actually, he always said, he always told us he had an eighth grade education. But then he passed away and I got to looking at some of the census tracts and things back in 1940. And he was listed there at our house and he was listed in, in that census tract. It said he had a sixth grade education rather than an eighth grade education. Uh, I explained that later by saying, well, he was Irish and he bragged a lot. So. <laughs> so my siblings and I were raised in extremely modest circumstances. I was six kids in a small two bedroom house. But during my career, I've rubbed shoulders with plenty of powerful and successful people. And one of the things I have become acutely aware of is that most of those who have considerable wealth and success they got to the top because from the earliest stage and earliest age, they had a network, a network of caring and influential people who made sure that they were fully equipped to succeed in school, in career, and in life. But for poor people, low-income people, people who come from where I come from, those whose parents or parent were poor and didn't go to college, they don't have that network. To the contrary, too many of them live in distressed communities and they go to schools that affluent families would never tolerate for their own children. Jonathan Kozel refers to these circumstances as savage inequalities. And I am haunted by Kozel's harsh conclusion, and I quote, one consequence of medical and early education denial is the virtual destruction of the learning skills of many children by the time they get to secondary schools. That's why I have been an outspoken champion of early childhood education. And you'll note that I, I don't use the word of preschool. I've tried to expunge that from my vocabulary because I don't think there is such a thing as preschool. I believe that education begins at birth and the preparation for education begins before birth. So I always try to refer to it as early education. So reaching disadvantaged kids before they start school, I didn't say before they started their education, is a crucial intervention point with a huge return on investment. It lays the early groundwork for all of the other crucial in interventions and investments, everything from Title I to reduce K through 12 achievement gaps to services like career tech, college planning, mentoring, reconnecting youth, engaging employers. And there's one other profound truth that I have learned. For so many disadvantaged young people, growing up without a network of supports we need to strive to create that network. And by we, I mean parents, local businesses, churches, and other places of worship, civil society, and more broadly, yes, the government. Quality public schools can be great ladders or ramps of opportunity. But when we bring folks together to create safe, supportive communities, that too builds a ladder or ramp of opportunity. That's why I'm a huge proponent of the Promise Neighborhood concept. As you may know, 
Harlem Children's Zone pioneered this model on a single city block in the 1990s and has since expanded it to 97 city blocks. The idea is to bring together educators, local leaders and employers, nonprofits, government agencies, to provide a full array of supports that children in our poorest neighborhoods need to succeed, from infancy to college or to career entry. This includes strengthening the civic fiber of these neighborhoods, from promoting affordable housing to offering adult education and legal aid. As the chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee for Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education, I have already boosted Promised Neighborhoods by providing increased funding. In addition, I have introduced the Promised Neighborhoods Act in the Senate to create federal grants to promote this model, and I secured inclusion of Promised Neighborhoods in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act reauthorization that passed out of our committee last fall. Finally, this afternoon, let me point out that a real opportunity nation must fully include young people with disabilities in school, work, and civil life. Again, a, a goal that has been a top priority throughout my career, as Rob Denson said, starting with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Right now, we're selling young people short who have disabilities. Of young people ages 20 to 24, the unemployment rate, and I'm not counting those in school, unemployment rate is over 60%. That's unconscionable. Shocking numbers. And no matter how, how many times I, 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 I tell them, it still is shocking. Fortunately, today's young people with disabilities uh, often call themselves and are called the ADA generation. They have high expectations for themselves, expectations that include work alongside their peers without disabilities. Because you see, these young people have grown up in an America reshaped by the Americans with Disabilities Act. For them, disability does not carry the fears, the myths, the stereotypes that lowered expectations for individuals with disabilities in earlier generations. So again, you have a whole group of young people out there that are not willing to take some job at sub-minimum wage. That's a dead-end kind of a thing. They want to be challenged. They want to be fully integrated with their peers in competitive employment, not some kind of employment that doesn't challenge their abilities. It's time. It's time. It's time to quit looking at young people with disabilities and seeing what they can't do we got to start looking at them and asking, what can you do? What are your abilities? Okay, you can't walk, what else can you do? You can't hear, what else can you do? You can't see, what else can you do? We've got to build on the abilities that every person with a disability has in our society. As the chair of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, I'm working on a bipartisan re reauthorization of the Workforce Investment Act, which authorizes a lot of our job training programs. One of the aims of that bill is to ensure that young people with disabilities and the various government programs that assist them, that integrated employment, integrated employment is the default position, not sheltered workshops or other segregated environments. And that's why I would offer to you, I would hope that the Opportunity Index, by the way, I'm very proud. I just heard that Iowa went from 13 to 7. We're on our way. I'm very proud of that. But I hope that the Opportunity Index that Opportunity Nation uses will also include in there the people with disabilities, young people with disabilities, and what opportunities are afforded them, both in education, job training, and employment in the various counties and states around the nation. I hope that will be a part of your index. So my friends, as I talk about early childhood education and promised neighborhoods and opportunities for youth with disabilities, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but uh, in fact of the more than 250 groups that make up Opportunity Nation, uh, you're pretty much like the Mormon Tabernacle Choir when it comes to providing a ladder of opportunity for all of our young people. So I can't thank you enough for the work that you are doing day in and day out all across America. 
You give a hand up to people who truly need it and deserve it, young people growing up in poverty or with some other disadvantage. You give them boots so they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You give them a ladder, or in the case of many people with disabilities, a ramp of opportunity. I always talk about a ladder of opportunity, but prior to the Americans with Disabilities Act, millions of Americans, no matter how hard they tried, couldn't climb that ladder because they were disabled. So what we did is we passed the Civil Rights Bill and we built a ramp of opportunity, a ramp. See, there's, there's not one nickel, not one dime goes to any person with a disability in the Americans with Disabilities Act. What we did is we said we're going to break down the barriers, we're going to fully integrate people with, with disabilities in all aspects of our life, and then we're going to challenge people with disabilities, go for it. But we're going to provide you the opportunity. So you do. You give them a ladder, a ramp of opportunity, you give them hope. In fact, the work you do is just about the most important work that I can imagine. So I'm proud to consider myself, hopefully, a citizen of Opportunity Nation. I am proud to be your partner and champion on Capitol Hill. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you all for your great work and the passion that you bring to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much.